appreciate the atmosphere. It is a spirit of celebration. I hope you feel it here today. It's an opportunity to bring independent energies, independent forces together in the community, in Washington County, specifically designed to unify our efforts that seems to have been uh, fractured, scattered, and inadequate to this point. We'd like to welcome you in behalf, on behalf of the Southern Utah Liberty Coalition, which is a group of independent groups that uh, have coalesced to bring this together, to make it possible, and to uh, share our desire for self-governance. We would like to begin, first of all, by an invocation. We've asked Welton Thorne of the Southern Utah, uh, the uh, Southern Utah G Assembly to give our invocation, after which we will have a Pledge of Allegiance to our Republic. Our dear Father in heaven, we give praise and glory to thee and thank thee for the opportunity to share together, to struggle to maintain and restore thy agency, that we might live in freedom according to thy law. We ask thy spirit to be with us as the message is given, are given in a way pleasing to thee, that you'll ride with those coming late, that they come in safety, that we leave in safety. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Now a most serious question as people are coming in. Which one of you brought this rain? <laughs> Don't you know it's St. George? <laughs> I, got, I got a guilty party over there. We hoped to fill this room. We're getting close. Did many of you or any of you see the uh, article this morning in the newspaper? It's wonderful coverage. It's, uh, it is significant. We even had one of the county commissioners call me this morning, uh, well, yesterday actually, and uh, had a scheduling problem, an emergency come up that changed his plans, but asked if he could spend five minutes here with you on the podium announcing some things going on in the county that are very, very uh, important. So um, we appreciate the synergy, we appreciate the energy around this group and what we're trying to do. And we're seeing that what we are doing is affecting what we would refer to as the establishment, the established um, govern, government that we have locally and as a county and as a state. And we want to see this grow and develop and come to fruition. But as all events like this, um, Murphy's Law plays his part here. We wanted to leave Murphy home today, but uh, one of our guest speakers is still en route, and so we're going to adjust the, uh, he, he just got here, good. We're going to adjust uh, a few minor things that I, I will deal, deal with, but um, what we're going to do, first of all, is thank those who have had a significant role in putting this together. First of all, the uh, Washington County Central Assembly, all those who have volunteered many days, many hours, and uh, in sacrificing their time and efforts to make this happen. We also called together these independent groups and had delegates meet with us so that they could put out the word with your various organizations <coughs> and uh, invite you here. We appreciate that. We appreciate our musicians and their contribution. We even appreciate the Denny's who contributed, the North Denny's there by on the boulevard, who contributed to uh, comping meals for our wonderful guests here in town. Um, 
I hope that as you came in, you grabbed our newsletter. Everyone got one? Anyone would like one that doesn't have one? It has our events uh, calendar uh, and schedule on there. But uh, we are, have friends of the Southern Utah Liberty Coalition that you see advertised on the back that actually is going to make this possible along with your uh, generous contributions to cover the cost of this, as, as you know, that are incurred. But uh, like the uh, Hurricane Carlot, a uh, wonderful group who understands um, our situation in, our, in a kind of a new economy, and the other friends who are advertising in our newsletter, we hope that you have uh, the heart to support them in, in their uh, business endeavors. So we thank them to make this, this possible. In this setting, in a group like this, we find that there are basically two people, two types of persons, two categories of people that we're addressing. First of all, are those who have been firsthand witnesses to events in their lives that are anything but friendly or positive. It, they have experienced um, things such as property seizures, foreclosures. Uh, they have uh, had traumatic events happen that uh, could be classified as uh, horrible, life-changing, destructive. And as a result of this firsthand experience, they know the, and, and can relate to the issues that we're going to be addressing here today. But then there's a whole different category of persons who have no clue, have not had the pleasure of having an account frozen and assets seized uh, without due process. They have not seen what a tyrannical and out of control, I, you know, if, if the, the shoe fits, you got to wear it, and I, I hate to identify it as a federal ent entity, but we have federal entities and, and governance that um, are out of control and who function outside the parameters of our basic constitutional ideals and laws. And for those who haven't had the pleasure, please stay tuned and uh, keep an open mind as you hear these things today. This is not a radical group. This is not the, uh, you know, marchers up and down. Uh, I mean, you see it happening. You see the events in the world today. Look at um, what's happening in the Middle East to those people who are raising up to demand liberty. Now, I keep hearing in the media that democracy is what they're after. I'm not sure it's democracy they're after, but freedom they certainly are. And we, in our own way, are rising up to demand liberty as outlined by our Constitution, which we love. Which brings me to introduce to you our first guest speaker, who is a constitutional scholar who is loved and appreciated, and many of you here today have uh, listened to his lectures before and are extremely motivated by it, and so we are pleased and proud to announce Stephen Pratt. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. It's an honor and a joy to be with you. I love people in St. George. It seems like I get more invitations to speak here than any place in the state. I'm not sure why. I hope the message will be of inspiration and strength. It's on restoring state sovereignty. Now, how is the sound in the room? It sounds to me like it's too loud, but you tell me. Is it too Boy, now whoever's in charge of the controls, you look out there and decide what that means. <laughs> what do you think? It's too loud? <laughs> take your hearing aids out if you're on the front row. The back row, Richard, did you say it was okay? You're okay. Okay, we'll try not to shout. Now, I have a message I want to try and present. It's 102 slides, and that should take 51 minutes, except I'm going to hurry, and it'll take 50. 
see how we come out on that. You're going to watch the clock. Okay. I'm going to take you back to ancient Rome. Now, this is a map of the Roman Empire, and the bottom portion, which is a, a, almost magenta, it's supposed to be kind of pink, is the Roman Empire in the year 9, 9 AD. Now, things were different there. They had had a republic. The republic is a thing of the past. Now, uh, Caesar Augustus is ruling, and things are pretty grim as the, they conquer and take over the, the territories. All they want to do is control and own the neighboring ground. That's their goal. And so the next big goal is to go into Germania. See right up here at the top? This is Germania. The year is 9 AD. And they had what they called Roman civil law, Roman law, or civil law, all words being synonymous. So for simplicity today, I'm going to call it Roman law. And this is law under the Roman Empire. Now they had a symbol. And every time Caesar was taken in his sedan chair and carried down the parade route, there would be people who would carry the flashies. And they would parade along showing Caesar's power. And Caesar's power was, was represented in this bundle of sticks held together by a blood red cord. And on the side was a battle axe. And the battle axe was, well, the sticks represented the states that Caesar had conquered. And the battle axe represented what they would do if you tried to get out of the union. So what this was was a union of states held together by coercion. And the Roman law was the ruling feature of that coercion. Now, Roman law included several features. All-powerful central government. National sovereignty. That means all power in the central government. Tax and control everything. Watchdog everyone's business. Promise prosperity and greatness. And fight wars anywhere on earth. This was Caesar's program. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> now, Roman law in 9 AD, they were intent on invading Germania. And so we show three red arrows, and these represent three Roman legions of 5,000 hardened soldiers and an auxiliary unit of 5,000 more. And so they had 20,000 people, and they were about to invade this Germania. Actually, they had already invaded, and they were just coming in again to keep management, control. See, some of the citizens of Germania didn't enjoy Roman law. And they didn't like living under that system. They liked the old way better. And so Rome decided to go in and bring order, discipline. Now, the battle lasted three days. They called it the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. And just two years ago, they celebrated the 2000th anniversary. And it's a big celebration over in Germania today. Three days after the battle started, the citizens of Germania took charge. And they had slaughtered nearly 20,000 Roman soldiers. It was a, a terrible loss for Caesar. And he went back and forth, it says in the history, pacing the floor, weeping and gnashing his teeth, crying out, Oh, what have they done with my legions? <laughs> They'd stolen the flag. Also, the eagle that was carried by the Roman legions had been stolen by the Germanians. This is a terrible loss. This was the man that was the leader. His name was Arminius, but they called him Herman. Herman is the English word for Arminius. You figure that one out. <laughs> and Herman the German decided in the year 9 that they would organize their troops and they would stop the Romans from encroaching any further on their ancient customs or on their customs at that time. They weren't ancient. They are now, though. I've been there. I stood down. To see how little these people are? This is huge. His sword is 23 feet long as he holds his sword up in the air. And I remember walking up the path as a young man about 20 years old and looking up at Herman. And you know what I thought? Where is the picnic lunch today? <laughs> I had no concept for freedom. I had no idea what Herman had done. It didn't matter. I just wanted to eat. Herman did something marvelous. Now, he didn't do it by himself. He did something marvelous for the people of Germania. He stopped the Roman encroachment with Roman civil law. And that means that they could then develop the common law. They didn't call it common law then, but it developed and became known as common law. The common law is based on the higher law. There's a law higher than man. And that higher law is what we should try and discover and then apply to solving the problems we have here on earth. Does that make sense? It's the higher law. Thomas Jefferson called it the laws of nature and of nature's God. God's will revealed in nature. God's will revealed in the Holy Scriptures. 
This was the common law in development. And so across northern Europe, the common law was now migrating along and developing. Meanwhile, the two contending forces, Roman law versus common law. Roman law was based upon political law. A legislative body would gather together. They would deliberate and pass a law, the law of man, not based on anything higher than just man himself, the current customs that they wanted to promote and uh, the current traditions the people wanted to encourage, whatever was the Roman law. They were happy in Germania to have Roman law stopped at the border. <laughs> Foundation of common law. Now memorize this. This is good stuff. I wish we had three hours on it. Okay, we're going to give you two of the foundation concepts. This is the fundamental foundation of common law. See if this sounds familiar. Do all you have agreed to do. When I was a little boy, my mother said, keep your promises. Do all you have agreed to do. This is the foundation of law in this country. It's called contract law. And the second part of common law, do not encroach on other persons or their property. As a little boy, I was taught, don't hit your sister and don't take anybody's stuff. This is common law, and it's the foundation for happiness. It's God's higher law applied in human relations. Now, Herman, I'm sure he was thinking, Rome, go home <laughs> and preserve our principles. That's why they had driven Rome out, so they could preserve the principles that developed into the common law. We fast forward now to Thomas Jefferson, and here's uh, 1,800 years later, and Jefferson frequently, he frequently spoke of restoring the ancient principles. Now they're 1,800 years old. <laughs> ancient principles. And Jefferson was one of the finest students of America and past history, probably the most prepared scholar of his day, a marvelous student of history. Pre restore the ancient principles. Restore the laws of nature and of nature's God. And then he elaborated. He said, way before ancient Rome took over were the ancient Israelites. And the Israelites had a system of representative government. We need to restore it. And then he explained in his writings and in his speeches that the ancient Israelites, and this represents, by the way, this is Moses and Jethro. And if you're a student of the Old Testament, you remember Jethro came to Moses and he was visiting the grandchildren and having a good time. And Jethro, and this is in the Bible. You can read it in the Bible. I'm just paraphrasing the story. And Jethro watched what was going on. Moses had just successfully led a departure from Egypt and they had about three million people out in the desert. Gee, he was in charge. He was governing three million people. Do you think there would be any problem with law and order? Yeah. So Moses sat in his tent every day, and he said to the people, just come to me and bring your problems, and I'll try to figure it out. All by himself, he was going to try and figure out the problems for three million. And his father-in-law said, Moses, my son, what thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thyself and this people that is with thee. Organize, get help. He says, divide your people up into tens, fifties, hundreds, and thousands. Now, you've heard this part. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Common sense tells us that's 10 heads of households, 50 heads of households. These are family units. 10 families organized, or 10, that's it. Anyway, you get the arithmetic. You're going to organize, you're going to have a structure. Each level got to choose their representative to have representative government. And then Moses said, solve your own problems. Only bring to me that which is most grievous and difficult to solve. And I calculated out one day, if you had 3 million people, that's roughly 75,000 new helpers that Moses acquired as he structured this representative form of government. These were ancient principles of which Thomas Jefferson was very conversant. He knew that system. They called it later common law. That's what developed, and that's what came into England in the year 450. After Herman had stopped the, the Romans, the Anglo, Angles and Saxe became the Anglo-Saxons. They migrated across northern Europe and into England, and they brought with them common law. Now they started to use that term. They organized into the same style of government as ancient Israel. A group of ten families was called a tithing. And the man they chose to direct and help be their leader was the tithing man. And then they organized a group of 50 families. And that was the vill or the village. And they had the vill man. And
And then they organized two veals into a hundred, and it was called the hundred. And guess what the name of the man was that presided over the hundred? You got it, the hundred man. Yeah, very t tough terminology here. And they would organize a group of hundreds, several groups, about a thousand families into the shire. And over the shire they would have a reef. But before we get to the reef, we've got two contending viewpoints, two forms of government that are clashing in the world's history. We have Roman symbol, civil law symbolized by the fasces, the bundle of states bound together by coercion, and the axe tied to the side to represent what would happen to any state that tried to withdraw from this union. In contrast to the common law, no, we need a symbol for the common law. What could we use? Well, the founding fathers asked several men to create a symbol. And guess who was on the committee? Thomas Jefferson. They called it the Great Seal. And they were going to create the Great Seal. And Thomas Jefferson said, based on his love for the great history of the past, on one side of the seal, we need ancient Israel being led by God's pillar of fire. So that's what this symbolized here. This isn't, he didn't, by the way, his suggestion wasn't accepted. It was verbal only, so we had an artist draw this picture about 1983. It's in the making of America. I was there when they did it. And the second thing he said we should have on the great seal on the other side, the heads of Hengist and Horsa. Now, this is actually the faces. I think gruesome when I think they're heads, you know, like not beheading. We want the faces of Hengist and Horsa, two great Anglo-Saxon chieftain who brought common law. They were the guardians of freedom. This is, this is history. You can read it. Just Google Hengist and Horsa. In fact, if any of you ladies are with child, you might think of naming them after a great hero of the past. Hengist or Horsa, especially if you have twins. This is an 11th century illumination, they call it. An illumination left in a book. Can you imagine if they could do that beautiful artwork in the 11th century? The central figure here is the king. He's come to visit the shire. And the chief magistrate over the shire is called the reeve or the reef. And so the king comes to collaborate with him. And obviously they're doing some kind of punishment right here. This looks like a hanging, actually. As the shire carries out his responsibilities... He's in charge of law enforcement. He's in charge of taxation. He's in charge of several responsible positions. He is the chief of the Shire. And so the Shire Reef, you've got it figured out already, don't you? It's called the Sheriff today. This is fun history. It's enjoyable history. I just really enjoyed reviewing it for this lesson today. Now, the sheriff was an early person to start being called forth in America. So way back in Maryland in 1634, they appointed a sheriff. And then over in Virginia in 1651, they appointed a sheriff. And we began to have this form of law enforcement coming from the old English common law. That's where this originated. That's why I pulled you back to old England before we got into today's lesson. Thomas Jefferson was supposed to have said. Now, I say supposed to have said. I have never heard him say it. And I haven't read it in his original handwritten notes. And so we, we often, every phrase I give, I should perhaps introduce with the statement, historians say, because it's difficult to find the truth. Now watch, what I'm going to give you an example right here, very elementary, but still significant. It is reported that Thomas Jefferson said, the office of sheriff is the most important of all executive offices of the country. It is important. Watch now what happens. I looked at this word and I thought, well, that's nice. I'd never seen it in print before. I, I saw this nice quotation. That sounds important, doesn't it? The sheriff's office is the most important executive office in the country. So then I thought, I'll read more about this. And so I read five accounts from five different sheriffs. And three of the sheriffs used the word country, and two of the sheriffs quoted Thomas Jefferson as saying the most important office in the county. Now notice there's only one letter difference. Just take out one R and you change the entire jurisdiction. Isn't that amazing? I don't know which one's right. I don't know if he even said it at all. But five sheriffs claimed he did, even though they didn't, dis they didn't agree on that R. I guess the point I brought that in for is this. I'm presenting to you the most accurate presentation I can, and I want you to know I don't know if it's an R county or country. And you'll see in a moment that good people, good people can write bad statements and they can make poor judgments. 
And that doesn't discredit their character. It's just that good people aren't always right. And we'll find out as I look at a more serious example. Fast forward again. Now we're in Salt Lake City. It's November the 5th, 1895. Something momentous is happening. They're having an election. And on that election ballot, they're voting. Should we or should we not accept the Utah, the Utah Constitution? And so on November the 5th, 1895, 31,305 for, 7,607 against, overwhelmingly passed. And then during the next few weeks, they launched and set up the government of Utah. Now, in that government, we should abide by this truism. We may only delegate to government that which we have the right to do ourselves. Do you have the right to protect your life, your liberty, and your property? Then you may delegate that right to a government servant, a public servant. Do you have the right to take from one neighbor to give it to the other neighbor? No. Then you can't delegate that to the government. This is what we believed in early Utah, that we had this fundamental basic need to delegate the protection of life, liberty, and property. Now, the Utah Constitution, under this document, we selected as people the state legislature, the governor, we organized the Utah government, and we delegated to them the right to pass laws to protect life, liberty, and property. One of the early things they did right in the beginning was to establish laws to provide for a county sheriff. And these are the numbers of the laws current today that establish that sheriff's office. A legal dictionary defines the sheriff as a creature of law created by the sovereign power in the state. A creature of law created by the sovereign power in the state. Now we're introducing the main theme of the lesson. What is the sovereign power in the state? What does that mean? This is an excellent read. Richard, do you have a pile of them here today? Good. Out on the table, you'll have the opportunity. This is both the front and the back cover of a little pocket-sized pamphlet. This is it right here. Excellent reading. As I look back on our history and I think about what's happened during my lifetime to try and restore liberty, this is one of the most significant court cases in, our, in, in my entire lifetime. And this will be the theme of Richard's talk today. And so I say, be sure and get one as you leave today. It's the, uh, the victory for state sovereignty. Mac Prince versus USA. As I recall, there were seven sheriffs, seven county sheriffs across the country that decided to contest and fight the federal government. That's kind of like Herman deciding to stop the Romans from invading. It's about the same level of magnitude. And Herman was able to succeed because of the help of many good citizens of Germania. He succeeded. Well, these, these seven sheriffs had a wonderful victory, but it won't do any good unless we, the citizens, build upon the, the accomplishment they had. Antoine Scalia wrote the majority opinion, and he did an excellent job, and you can read the summary of it in here. Just profound. Some of the things he said are just profound. But I want to call your attention, kind of like the sheriffs didn't all know whether it was country with an R or county without an R. And so some of the things he said perhaps will be misleading. It will help you to see the rest of the story. <laughs> On page 7 he writes, It is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. Now whenever I read any book, I've learned to have a pencil handy or a pen, and if something bothers me, I mark it. And so I marked incontestable. Anytime anybody says to me, it's incontestable, I always think, yeah, that's a red flag. Yeah, let's think about that now. It's blindly obvious. Any fool can see. Then you know for sure you put up a red flag, <laughs> and it's, it better be contested. Well, he goes incontestable. So I circled that, and then I underlined dual sovereignty. Now, I didn't do that for this lesson. I just did it when I read the book because I knew he was wrong, or I had a suspicious belief that he was wrong. Why did I put, you, oh, you can't see it. There's a question mark right here, okay? Okay, boy, that was exciting. He, got, he lost weight, didn't he? Okay, did the United States Constitution establish a system of dual sovereignty? You just ask that question. Then you look for the evidence to see what the system was. Now, some of you heard me speak on this. 
And we're going to give the summary of that lesson today. So keep this question in mind. Did the United States Constitution establish a system of dual sovereignty? Then in the next sentence he says, although the states surrendered many of their powers to the new federal government, why did I circle surrendered many and put a question mark by it? Did the states surrender many of their powers? No, absolutely not. I don't care if it's the President of the United States or the top man in the Supreme Court or just the county sheriff. If you tell the truth, it's true, and if you don't, it's false. And this man is erred. He's erred here. Even though he's a great man and did an outstanding job of writing the court case, and these are not the only places you need to investigate. As you're reading, study anything from any author, as you listen to me, think, I wonder if he's telling the truth. <laughs> and then go home and try and prove it one way or the other. Look for the evidence. Did the states surrender many of their powers to the new federal government? Now, we're going to answer that in the lesson, but the answer is no, they didn't. Now, this, the Tea Party groups. I get invited and supported by Tea Party groups frequently. I just got invited to speak at a Tea Party group in South Dakota. Spoke there last year. They come back. More. We want more. In their current, one of their current newsletters, it said, current choices in Washington, D.C. are a grave threat to our national sovereignty. Well, really now, what is national sovereignty? Did the United States Constitution establish national sovereignty? See, we're back on the same question about the Supreme Court justice and what he said. And what is state sovereignty? Well, oh, don't we have dual sovereignty? Well, some people say we do. Let's trace that through history and see what we can find out. Alexander Hamilton, one of the prominent founding fathers, had a strong opinion, and uh, he spoke it often, and he spoke the truth many times, and here's one of the things I believe he said that was true. Two sovereignties cannot coexist within the same limits. Oh, really? Does that mean you can't? Well, let's try it here. In other words, state sovereignty and national sovereignty cannot exist at the same time. Well, now, if that's true, if Alexander Hamilton's right, then Justice Scalia is wrong. You can't have dual sovereignty if it's impossible to have it. So who's telling the truth if either one of them is? Maybe they're both wrong. Albert Taylor Bledsoe, a fascinating story. He wrote a book in 1907. He lived through try, trying times in this country. And when he was an old man, he wrote, I think I'd better tell my grandchildren what happened because the story hasn't been told yet. And so he wrote the story of the period that he lived through called the Civil War. And he wrote in 1907, Ever since the Declaration of Independence, there have been two great political parties in the United States. Now, he wasn't talking about Republicans and Democrats. He's talking about two contending forces. Ever since the beginning, there have been two contending forces, like Roman law versus civil law. Those are two, excuse me, Roman law versus common law. Those are two contending forces. And he's referring to that. One force believed the states are districts of people composing one political society. The American people form one consolidated nation. The other force believed the states are free, sovereign, independent, and maintain this status even after creating and ratifying the Constitution. One force believed we the people of the United States is a nationalist system. The other force believed we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Maryland, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania are a federative system. Oh, you mean there's a difference? One a nationalist system, one a federalist system, and they're opposites. Now, the nationalist, uh, there were many of them. Here are some of the prominent men that are nationalist over the period of American history. Alexander Hamilton, perhaps, is the most famous of the nationalists. John Marshall, the very renowned John Marshall of the Supreme Court. Nathan Dane, one of the authors of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. These are prominent men. President Abraham Lincoln, Joseph Story, Daniel Webster. You've heard of all of them, perhaps, except Nathan Dane. But prominent men. These men were all nationalists. They believed in a powerful central government, very similar to that of ancient Rome, and that if the states didn't comply with what they felt was the proper role of government, they ought to be coerced into to, to complying. This was the nationalist position. We could call this same system today after the old name, Roman law, powerful central government bound together by coercion. 
Two contending forces, the sovereignty of the national government versus the sovereignty of the individual states. These are some of the famous prominent men who were states' rights advocates. And they were the people like Thomas Jefferson, Luther Martin, Patrick Henry, John Taylor of Caroline, St. George Tucker, James Madison. Now, many of these names, some of them you never heard of before, or you don't know a thing about them. It's because the nationalist won. The nationalist finally prevailed, and their viewpoint of history is the one that's presented all over the country today. And we don't hear the other viewpoint. It's very rare that we hear any quotations from St. George Tucker or St. John Taylor of Caroline. Well, we do hear Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, but we don't follow what they said. We just quote them and say, isn't that beautiful what they said? Now let's follow Alexander Hamilton instead. That's what we do, even though most of us don't know that's what's going on. These men were Anglo-Saxon common law believers. They were guardians of freedom. They were promoters of the common law. There were two contending forces. A unitary republic, one nation indivisible, by coercion if necessary. That was the viewpoint of the nationalist. And the other one, a republic of republics, by consent of the governed, voluntary. Now, I added on top of this slide, just, just like yesterday, the news release. It was only three weeks ago that in the state capitol they voted, what is our form of government today? And what did they decide? After weeks of debate, heated debate, much emotion, it said in the newspaper, what did they decide? The Utah State Legislature voted that we are a compound constitutional republic. That's it. That's it. That's law now. It's in the law of the state of Utah. And the school teachers are supposed to teach that. I don't think they know what that is. Well, I tell you what it is. It's a republic of republics. It's the old-fashioned concept that America is made up of many republics, and somehow, I don't know where they got the word compound, <laughs> somehow they came up with the word compound constitutional republic. I am delighted that they acknowledged a majority. Of, in fact, it said without dissent. It passed without dissent, meaning that the dissenters didn't vote. <laughs> Abel Parker Upshur was a great scholar of the past, he was the Secretary of State under John Tyler, who in my opinion was one of the greatest presidents that ever lived. We've never heard his name before. That's because he did what he was supposed to do. A president's not supposed to go out and fight big wars and carry on hor horrible programs to try and bring everybody health care or some other scam device. The president stayed home in the White House, minded his own business, and did his duty. His name was John Tyler, and he appointed Abel Parker Upshur as Secretary of State. And this excellent book, it's out on the table. His picture's not on the front cover. You'll have to go by the title. The True Nature and Character of Our Federal Government. It's well done. Written in 1842 about. Maybe it was 1840. I don't know why I have that number up there. It must be 1840. Historians say it was written in 1840. It wasn't published until 1863. It was needed then in 1863. He says... In order to a correct understanding of the Constitution, it is absolutely necessary to understand the situation of the states before it was adopted. Now, all of these contending force issues, are we a republic or republics, or are we a democracy? What are we? You cannot understand that until you understand the situation of the states before the Constitution was adopted. Let's see if we can go through that one. British America, the year is 1774. Historians say that the map looked like this. The situa situation of the states before the Constitution was adopted. Now, here's evidence. Uh, evidence is something we look for in history. This evidence is primary source. It's Thomas Jefferson writing in 1774, two years before the Declaration of Independence, he writes, a summary view of the rights of British America. He's writing for the House of Burgesses, and they're going to send this letter to King George to complain, and they're going to tell him why they feel, how they feel, and so on. Well, in that letter, he repeatedly refers to the colonies as the states of British America. The states, the states, the 15 times, I believe, the count was. He calls these colonies the states in 1774. Now, I bring this out because your local history books say... On July the 4th, 1776, the word states began to apply. 
and they were now called states. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't care. I don't care who wrote the history book. This is evidence that that history book is wrong. And there are numerous other pieces of evidence we can lay out, and we have done that in this town in the past. The 13 colonies or states in 1774 would also be called kingdoms because they had a king, each colony being separate and free from the other colonies. There was no political tie between the 13 colonies. That's why I have divided them here. I separated them with an exacto knife so that you could tell they were separate and distinct. And each one had his own form of government. They had developed over a long period of time, and they each shared the same king. Well, he was the same king of England, Ireland, Scotland, France. Different kings over different times were over different countries. It was not uncommon, so he had 13 countries here over which he was the king. At this time, it was King George the Third. Now, William Penn was supposed to have said, colonies are the seeds of nations. So how many nations were planted here? Thirteen. And how many nations are going to come forth? No, 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 no. I knew I'd get that answer. You didn't say that, did you? I didn't hear that on the front row. You're a star student. I never heard a thing. <laughs> the seeds of nations were planted. See, this is, this is very difficult for people to grasp because they've never heard it before. This is so foreign to the average American student, they, ha they can't even grasp that 13 nations were born. Not one. You see, the nationalist viewpoint is one great nation was born and the aggregate whole of the people then created the Constitution. That's a lie. And that's the popular viewpoint being taught in all the schools that I can find across the country. The truth is, it was quite different. Thirteen seeds were planted. Thirteen nations were born. I love this history book. It's a high school history book. It weighs 5.3 pounds. And there are 1,080 seven pages and in that book you can read the English colonies in America had originated as quite separate projects and for the most part they grew up independent of one another with little thought that they belonged or ought to belong to a unified imperial system that is a correct statement they grew up independent of one another they did not belong to a, a common political entity they were in not one nation in any means or way whatever in other words, each colony had its own customs and culture. Each colony had developed a will of its own. Each became an independent, sovereign nation. This is an excellent read. The Sovereignty of the States, written in 1910. You know, I love reading old books. Just for some reason, it's refreshing to read an old viewpoint. One that hasn't had the dust brushed off of it for 150 or 200 years. Or even 1,000 or 2,000. Good way to learn. In this old book he writes, In wresting the power, or what is called the sovereignty from the crown, it passed directly to the people. Now this is a correct statement. We just, the, the king in England is sovereign. He held the sovereignty. What he said over life or death for some time, not always the kings changed in power, but they wrested the sovereignty from the crown, or from the king, and it passed directly to the people. But then he goes on, and this is the key. It passed directly to the people of each colony and not to the people of all the colonies in the aggregate, to 13 distinct communities and not to one. In the American Dictionary of the English Language of 1828, Noah Webster writes, Nation, a body of people united under the same sovereign or government as the French nation. Okay, get that definition because we're going to have the question on the next slide. A body of people united under the same sovereign or government. That is a nation. In July 1776, were these 13 states united under the same sovereign or government? No. Simple enough, isn't it? And yet this is not understood or taught in any place I know of except my classrooms. I've never heard another teacher teach this. It's so apparent from the evidence. Summary. The popular notion that a new nation was born on the 4th of July has no basis in fact. The evidence shows that 13 colonies were the seeds of 13 nations. On declaring independence from the mother country, these 13 nations each wrote their own plan of government. Each new nation assumed among the powers of the earth their separate and equal station. That's the language from the Declaration of Independence. We assume our separate 13 separate and equal stations. Why did the 13 new nations call themselves states? 
definitions. Now, when we talk about, when we use language, words, words have meaning. But we need to use the meaning of the word as it was used when it was written, not what we think it means today. So why did they call themselves states? We need to go back and see what was a state in the years 1774 to 1828. The whole body of people united under one government. Usually the word signifies a political body governed by representatives, a commonwealth. Political body governed by representatives. Republic, a commonwealth. Now just a minute. A state is a commonwealth. A republic is a commonwealth. They're both governed by representatives. A republic is a commonwealth, a state in which the exercise of the sovereign power is lodged in the representatives elected by the people. So we've got three words that are interchangeable here. When Rand Paul ran for senator in Kentucky, he referred to Kentucky as the Commonwealth of Kentucky. That's very appropriate. Now, in the 1774 Oxford English Dictionary, and I want to go back to that one so that you know we're working right at the same time this happened. In the 1774 edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, the definition of a Congress is very interesting. See, the first Continental Congress was gathered in 1774. And in 1774, what was Congress? A formal assembly of representatives from various sovereign nations. How many sovereign nations were there in 1776? There were 13. Now, 1774, they hadn't quite separated from the mother country. They were just thinking, you know, oh, what's, what's our future going to lead us to? But they still, in the Oxford English Dictionary, remind us that Congress was a gathering of representatives from various sovereign nations to discuss common problems. And that's what they did in 1774. The Continental Congress gathered together. They were at a coordinating mechanism. Twelve of the states sent delegates and one of them refused. The Second Continental Congress met two years later in 1776. They deliberated and among other things they adopted the Articles of Confederation. Now those articles had no life. All these congressmen were, were representatives to come together and offer suggestions, a coordinating unit. They had no life until each state had its own delegation at home in the state decide if they would accept the proposal by Congress. And so they did. One state at a time, they accepted and ratified this document, the Articles of Confederation of Perpetual Union. How long is perpetual? Forever. How long did these last before they seceded from this union? Oh, about three or four years. <laughs> and, and they soon recognized that this perpetual union wasn't a proper procedure, but guess what? They had joined it voluntarily, and they could leave it voluntarily. Just what they did. Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence. Even though they had confederated and had a few things that they were going to share in common, they still were to retain the power because all of the powers they gave to the Union were delegated powers. No ceded powers. No surrendered powers. Just delegated powers. Delegate. Send with a trust or commission to act for another. Surrender, and I'm picking right back into Anton Scalia's public publication. Surrender means to yield, to cede, to give up, to grant. That's a permanent thing when you surrender. I surrender, I give up, you can take over. No, they didn't surrender anything. There was no surrendering of any power in the Articles or in the Constitution. The Second Treaty of Paris is evidence. It's evidence about sovereignty, state sovereignty. It was developed and approved by 14 free, sovereign, and independent states. 14? I thought there were 13, Mr. Pratt. Pay attention! England was a free, sovereign, independent state, and they were there at the bargaining board, and they signed also. And so we had 14 states sign on to the Second Treaty of Paris. And here King George is in his finery. I don't imagine he wore this to that event. But here he is in his finery. He's the king that signed a statement that declared. Now, I when we talk about history, we're talking about evidence. What's true, what's false, and what don't we really know? And we try to look at the evidence and see if we can piece together the story. Sometimes there's not enough. This is good evidence. The state, uh, excuse me, the said United States. He then names each state individually are free, sovereign, and independent states. Now, 80 years later, a president of the United States would, would say, and it would be written, 
there were never any sovereign states. Never. Oh, except for Texas. And it gave up all its sovereignty when it joined the Union. I'm quoting from the 1861 address of the President of the United States. Well, it's a lie. doesn't matter who said it. If it's a lie, it's still a lie. This is actually what happened. Not long after that, they held the Convention of States in 1787. It's a famous painting. You can remember seeing it. And here we had George Washington presiding, and he sat on the chair with his son on the back of the chair. Old Franklin comes up at the end, and he says, I've, I've often wondered what the sun was. I wondered if it was a rising sun or a setting sun. Ah, he says, methinks it is a rising sun, <laughs> as the Constitution was completed and, and signed. That's this chair right back here. This is another great book from the past, written in 1878 by a fine scholar. The Republic of Republics. In fact, it's so good, there's a stack of them on the table. I've read it twice completely, carefully through, and studied many sections over and over. He does several chapters on sovereignty. I commend it to you. That takes a serious learner. If you're not a serious learner, then get the little pamphlet on the corner of the table. It's free. It's only four pages, and it's uh, so easy to read. I know it's good. I wrote it myself. If you want the easy version, if you want the long version, then you start reading the tomes that I've read to try and condense it down. So in the Republic of Republics, Bernard Sage writes, In fine, the states federalized and did not nationalize themselves. The former would necessarily be done by equal sovereigns, while the latter would make them counties or provinces of a nation, remanding them to their British condition. Now our governor... The governor of this state had something to say on this just recently. He says, we're not colonies. Isn't that the word he used? We're not colonies. And on my watch, I'll see that we retain statehood. It's on, yes, it's on your newsletter. You'll have it on your lap if you've got the newsletter. It's a great statement from the governor of Utah. Denouncing the concept that we are provinces or counties. No, we're a state. We just lost our sovereignty a long time ago, and now we're going to try and understand and how we can peacefully reclaim it. And the process is going forth, and it's beautiful. American Dictionary of the English Language. Sovereign. Now pay attention. We're going we're to bring these two contending forces together. Sovereign. Supreme in power. The possession of the highest power. Now, can two entities hold the highest power at the same time? Not in the same space. That's right. And so it's impossible to have... What kind of sovereignty? You're catching on. <laughs> okay, supreme in power, the possession of the highest power. Now, these guys were cousins. I learned that one night in a lecture. I was yakking away, and I said, I wonder if these guys were related. And it wasn't 30 seconds, and somebody raised his hand looking at his iPod or his computer in his lap, and he says, they were cousins. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so they were cousins. They were 17 years apart in age, Noah being the oldest. Noah was a fine, respected man. So was Daniel Webster. But they had a different viewpoint. Noah published in his dictionary the meaning of the word sovereignty at, as it was commonly used in the days of the founding fathers. So when we hear King George and we see statements of sovereignty from the writings in the Federalist Papers and the old documents, it's the definition of Noah Webster that applies. Supreme in power, the possession of the highest power. Well, Daniel Webster, he was a nationalist. No, 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 that's not sovereignty. Sovereignty, he says, is the sum of all rights and powers. And I thought, well, if that's sovereignty, and the sovereignty is, was wrested from the crown and it's held by the people, and if all it is is the sum of the rights and powers, let's say the people decide to give half their powers to the, so the federal government, half to the state government. If that's what sovereignty is, how much sovereignty do the people then have? Zip, none. That's ridiculous. We know that's not the definition of sovereignty, but he said it was. <laughs> and he was a prominent man. The great God Webster, they called him. The greatest orator of the day. And still, if you say something wrong, it doesn't matter who you are. It's still wrong. Well, let's see what happened. He was a nationalist. He was a states' rights advocate, at least in the definitions in the dictionary. <laughs> now, consolidating school was a name they applied to themselves. Daniel Webster was just one of the prominent men in the consolidating school. In the consolidating school, they believed sovereignty is the sum of all rights and powers. In the Constitution, sovereignty is delegated to the central government, which is an irrevocable ceding of power. Do you see anything wrong with this? Delegated and ceding are, are, are contradictory terms. 
in the same sentence. You would have to have Orwellian doublethink to understand this sentence. This is a nationalist perspective. Two contending forces. The consolidating school believed states have sovereignty so far as they have ceded it. Really? Where did they get that notion? Not from any evidence I can find. These are nationalists promoting their nationalist concept, and they won. This became known as dual sovereignty. This is where it comes from. Clear back in the beginning, the nationalists wanted the people to believe that they had sovereignty in the states and sovereignty in the national. But listen to this. This is the best quotation I've seen on this. This man lived in 1823. Near the end of his life, he wrote a, his, his book. It was a law textbook, fine lawyer. Loved and respected man. The consolidating school contends. Now we're back talking about the consolidating school that they want you to believe there's dual sovereignty. Here's what he says. The consolidating school contends that we have two sovereignties, but that one is sovereign over the other. Mr. Hamilton, that we have coordinate sovereignties, but that one is made superlative. That's right. I, we're both equal, but I'm more equal than you are. This, this comes right out of the era when the founding, the ink hadn't hardly dried on the Constitution, and they were already ramming and pushing to have dual sovereignty. It is not the way the Constitution was established. The true nature and character of our federal government is State sovereignty. Listen to a little bit of evidence. This is at least an expert witness. If it's not evidence, it's an expert witness. Each state, in ratifying the Constitution, it's considered as a sovereign body, independent of all others, and only to be bound by its own voluntary act. In this relation, then, the new Constitution will, if established, be a federal and not a national Constitution. Now, that's in the Federalist Papers. This is a really popular book. There's some out on the table. Buy one if you've never read it. This is Federalist number 39. Don't start at number one. It'll drive you crazy. Start at 39 or somewhere else. Number 10. Pick one of those out. You like the topic. Look in the index. <laughs> Look up slavery in the index and see what the Federalists say about slavery. It's just a good book, a good book to study. He, he had so many points in here that are so powerful each state in ratifying the Constitution is considered as a sovereign body. So what about the president 80 years later that said there were never any sovereign states? Who's right? Well, we have two expert witnesses, don't we? We don't know if either one's right yet, but you can find more evidence and you can build yourself an understanding if you'll apply yourselves. Independent of all others and only to be bound by its voluntary act? You mean we're not coerced to be in a union? You mean it was intended originally that we were voluntary? That was the original intent. It wasn't until 80 years later that we became a coerced union. In this relation, then, the new constitution will be, it'll be a federal and not a national constitution. This is good material. I wish we had more time. Our government system is established by compact, not between the government of the United States and the state governments, but between the states as sovereign communities. Oh, that's, that's good stuff. Helps us formulate what happened. It's an expert witness. Summary, the true nature and character of our federal government was state sovereignty. Now, I've worked this over for years and years and years. I've searched, and I just want to know what's true, what really happened. And I've concluded this is the truth. We really had state sovereignty, and then it was wrenched away from us just like we wrenched the sovereignty from the king. It was wrenched away from the states. And today we have national sovereignty. I'll show you how it happened in the remaining seconds. Countdown. Don't, don't count down yet. Beautiful explanation of what happened. Remember, there were two contending forces. One believed in sovereignty of the national government, and one believed in sovereignty of the individual states. This man, Bernard Sage, I think he did the best job of any I've read on sovereignty. He spent about three, four chapters on it. Well done. He's meticulous laying out the evidence. So meticulous that you say, I've read that ten times. Do I have to read it three more? He gives you every example from every state every time. 550 pages of fine print with no pictures. <laughs> yeah. 
And I thank God for Bernard Sage recording that and passing it on to our generation. It is available. It's out on the table. He makes it clear to me. He says, this leads, after two or three chapters on the topic, he says, this leads to the solacistic absurdity. Oh, I'm just a blacksmith from Coldfort. I don't know what words like that mean. <laughs> solacistic. But I thought I would try and find out. A solacistic absurdity. I mean, that's really serious. I sound really serious. So I looked. I had to go through about three dictionaries before I found the word solacism. That's as close as I could get. And solacism means, uh, the simplest definition, absurd. <laughs> it is an absurd absurdity to declare there is dual sovereignty. There is divided sovereignty. There is delegated sovereignty. There is qualified sovereignty, limited sovereignty, representative sovereignty, federal sovereignty. He published this book in 1878. I've heard and seen all these statements in this last 10 years as they refer to our federal government and our system as dual, federal, and so on, sovereignty. Oh, the states have sovereignty. It's just that we're superlative to the states, <laughs> and so on. This is nonsense. It's utter nonsense, and yet some of the finest scholars, some of the least, what do we say? If you haven't done your homework, you won't know the difference. If you put your effort into it, I think you'll come to the conclusion that there was never such a thing as dual sovereignty. That is a figment of the imagination of the do-gooders called nationalist. Can a state delegate some of its sovereignty to the federal government? Now, you've learned enough now. Can we delegate sovereignty? No, you can't delegate sovereignty. You delegate powers, specific things to do. Do you surrender those powers? No, you delegate the powers. And that's what you delegate is just loaned, and you can take it back again. This is how the system was supposed to work. Can sovereignty be divided? Not the original kind not the kind established by our founding fathers, not the kind wrenched away from King George III. You cannot divide that. Think of the word sovereignty like the word pregnancy. Either a woman is pregnant or she isn't. <laughs> there is no such thing as dual pregnancy. Likewise, there is no such thing as dual sovereignty. <laughs> I mean, how do we say it clearer than that? I didn't do that right away. I was in Idaho Falls, and I got done with the, the middle, you know, I got done with a part of my message, and I stood down there on the floor, and somebody came up and says, and they gave me that example. Hey, yeah, I got that. I got, I grasped that. <laughs> At the federal convention, you know, you know what he said. I'm going to give that same quote again. Two sovereignties cannot coexist within the same limits. That's true. And so let's not hear of dual sovereignty. Let's hear the truth. Either the federal government is sovereign or the states are sovereign independently from one another, but they are not sovereign at the same time. It's impossible. It's a solacistic absurdity. Try that on your next opportunity. <laughs> now, he went on to explain. Pay attention to this one. This is still at the federal convention. He's up there trying to persuade these delegates at the convention of what he thinks the best system of government should be. We must establish a complete sovereignty in the general government. The general power, if it preserves itself, must swallow up the state powers. Wow. In other words, he knows you can't have two sovereignties in the same sphere at the same time, so he says we've got to put the sovereignty into the federal government. It's got to swallow up the state governments. That's the way it's got to be, gentlemen. Did the founding fathers embrace Alexander Hamilton's ideas? No. In fact, he got so disgusted he went home. You didn't know that part, did you? Alexander Hamilton and the New York Convention walked out on the convention. And he, the others never came back, the other two. He finally came back and continued to share his thinking. They never accepted it. This was his thinking. The general power, if it preserves itself, must swallow up the state powers. This is the nationalist position of the two contending forces. These men are examples of the nationalists, and there were hundreds of them. These are just some of the prominent ones. They were nationalists. They believed the general power must swallow up the state powers. Now, they were good men. I don't doubt that. All good, decent men. At least I hope they were. But they had this belief based on a false educational idea. Jefferson's world was quite different. They believed maintain free, sovereign, independent states. States' rights, we call it today. These were states' rights advocates. They believed maintain free, sovereign, independent states. Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian were words that were formed. You want me to cut it? One minute. One minute. Now we see what we can do in one minute. 
Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian were words that were created back then to describe the two contending forces. The two contending forces were basically Roman law versus common law. That's as simple a language as we can apply. And because they were so different, on the 4th of July we praised Jefferson, but we live in Hamilton's world. We all praise Jefferson, you'll roast weenies and you'll think, oh, the Declaration, what a wonderful thing. But we live in Hamilton's world, and so we show them here butting heads. <laughs> Summary. Sovereignty is possession of the highest power. It is impossible for both the states and federal government to possess the highest power at the same time. When the sovereign states created the Constitution, they delegated a few enumerated powers to their new agent called the federal government. They did not surrender many powers to the new federal government. The National Union Party declares victory. The Nationalists won. We've got to do uh, 30 seconds worth in the next, no, 10 minutes worth in the next 30 seconds. This was the President of the United States at a great convention in Philadelphia. I'd never heard of the convention until three years ago or four. When I first read the Republic of Republics, he quoted from the convention, and this is what he quoted. This is the political body called the National Union Party, and they agreed. This is the thing they came to an agreement on. The insurrection, that's called the Civil War, the insurrection against the supreme authority of the nation has been suppressed. The victory achieved by the national government has been final and decisive. It has established beyond all further controversy and by the highest of all human sanction, the absolute supremacy of the national government. Amazing. I'd never heard that until, like I say, three or four years ago. I didn't know there was a party that made a declaration that national sovereignty was now the, the form of government on which we were living, but they declared it. That was the, the leading party. They declared it in the state Supreme Court of Texas, uh, not Texas, the United States Supreme Court in Texas versus White. They declared national sovereignty. These are evidence of the past. Is there any question which of the two contending forces was in control? The nationalist won a long time ago, way before your great-grandparents were born. This old man, oh, wonderful. I'm not going to read it. It's just fabulous what he had to say when he was 86 years old. He says, I can't stand it any longer. I've got to say this. And he wrote a plea for the Constitution of the United States, wounded in the house of its guardians. Who wounded it? And what did they do? Google it up. You can read it on the Internet. Nobody will, though, generally speaking. They don't do that. That's too hard. Where are we today? Here we are in the halls of Congress. We're looking now directly in at the speaker's stand. A picture is worth a thousand words. Really? Can you see it? What should we do? Use your two eyes. Get informed and get involved. <laughs> That's what we're doing here today. Three, there are three publications I'm going to flash on the screen and then I'm done. Nullification by Thomas Woods. Excellent reading. Excellent reading. Read it. Study it. Apply it. I just finished yesterday. Roll back. There are two cases of them. One case is sitting out on the table. Read it. Study it. Follow it. Excellent thinking from a clear-thinking American. And then this is the next round. I'm just excited to hear Richard, his book, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. I want to say again, Richard Mack and the sheriffs that joined him, a total of seven, I consider to be American heroes of the highest order, that in defiance of the Roman law, the Roman legions, they stood up and bravely defied the federal government, took it to the Supreme Court, and won. Thank you very much. As we uh, are setting up for our next guest speaker, I want to make a few comments, and one being that I have a confession to make, that I have been asleep on these issues for so many years. It's glad to be, I am happy, and I am glad to be now consciously aware of what's going on, because now we have information accurate history information, historical information that encouches what should be known, should be taught, should be understood in our schools, but uh, unfortunately is not done. What would happen to our nation? What, how would it affect, I know those people out there, how are you? <laughs> I see so many friends that we invited, I'm just so excited to see 
and feel your spirit. And I ask, how would it affect the country? How would it affect your life individually if you had known then what you know now? If our neighbors know now what they should? And so we have some questions to ask. And as he, uh, as our next guest speaker uh, sets up, there's a phrase that many uh, of our public officials, particularly armed forces, take an oath. When they raise their arm to a square, they say as part of their oath that they're uh, protecting and defending us against two enemies, two types of enemies, both foreign and domestic. And you know, I had to look in the mirror just the other day. I said, what in the world is a domestic enemy? You know, and you know, and I, I know most of you know the answer, but I'll tell you what, I didn't until I see reports like this. Banks found guilty of foreclosure fraud. Posted Tuesday, December 28, 2010, by uh, a particular um, real estate uh, per, um, paper online. It says, as a result of recent investigations launched by the Florida Attorney General's Office, Bank of America, GMAC Bank, J.P. Morgan, Chase, and others have been found guilty of foreclosure uh, fraud. How many lives here would that affect? Raise your hand if that's affected you. Absolutely. It affects everybody, and this is an awakening moment because you don't really understand how it's affecting you. Uh, we have a task force, in fact, as part of the Washington County Central Assembly that is studying these issues that if you look on the very back of your newsletter, you will see on the bottom right-hand corner a, uh, a, a, an email address uh, through which you can use to inquire, get information, further information on all political and social issues. And uh, we pride ourselves in the expertise in our group that would allow some support and some information, direction, whatever you need as a community. We see our group as a catalyst to the community to bring us together and understanding what, what in the heck's going on. It says here, Wells Fargo Bank has admitted to 55,000 counts of perjury. Just one bank, one bank. That's just what they admitted. I have another one here of a county that's doing something about it. Uh, Maine, uh, Sedgwick, Maine, has done what no other town in the United States has done. The town has unanimously passed an ordinance giving its citizens the right to produce, process, sell, purchase, and consume local foods of their choosing. What a concept. What a concept. They're standing up and they say, uh, hey, we've had enough. And it's kind of interesting to see the full circle of the evolution of our uh, stay here in North America, coming here, raising our own crops, doing our own thing. And then for the mode of convenience, uh, it's more practical, let's centralize everything, let's, let's trim off the edges, let's make it work here really nice, like a well-oiled machine. Well, we're finding out that maybe that's not the best way. There was a, a gentleman I'm sure some of you may know uh, who made a statement in a, in a publication that I want to paraphrase in part of my introduction to our next guest speaker. This is a, a retired sheriff who had been in the, uh, in the service for over 45 years, and he wrote on December 22, 2010, and I'm going to just paraphrase part of what he said. It is important to understand that the U.S. Code contains many thousands of statutory laws. Arguably, one cannot get through one day without violating at least one or more of these statutes. They are all inclusive, intrusive, and invasive to every segment of our day, uh, our day-to-day -day existence. They're in every single room of our house. They are a virtual web of entrapment and have been specifically drafted for that purpose. 
These statutes are a practical catch-all that enables the Federal Government, through its increasingly impressive uh, enforcement agencies, to control the control of ignorant and complacent people. As I share this with you, I want you to see where you fall in this, uh, this scenario. The United States Code, as it exists, is an enemy of justice and it separates the people from their inherent liberties. Those who think that these laws, these statutes, many of them blatantly unconstitutional, are not binding on them and that they, have, they are not subject to the to totalitarian state may be mistaken. Federal prisons contain many who thought likewise and they will languish in those prisons until the sentences expire on those transgressions of certain capricious and arbitrary statutes that were imposed by a system that now has complete autonomy over complacent people. Now one ma must ask, who will risk the wrath of the agents of a totalistic system? Who's going to stand up? Who dares get behind, gets out from behind the shield? Who is it that will come to your aid and defense? He says, the sheriff says, the answer is no one. I do admire, he says, those who have put forth an effort, but it's been too little, too late. And he says, in conjunction with our last speaker, not too many years ago when he started law enforcement, officers were functioning under the last vestiges of common law. The lower courts were still occupied by individuals that were selected by the people. Cases, and we found this in our own county, cases were most office most often initiated by a petition or filing with an electric, uh, elected justice of the peace, and the sheriffs were sovereign and endowed in the authority to summon the power of the county and through the governor and the power of the state, the all-encompassing and all-corrupted bureaucracies had not come to full realization that they have today. By the mid-70s, state legislatures without rational reason and at the in, uh, institution of the state bar associations undertook a massive revision of state codes, including the criminal statutes. Elected officials like the Justice of the Peace, the Township Constable, were eliminated without the slightest protestation from the people. The Justices of the Peace were replaced by politically appointed judicial magistrates that were mandated that these people were lawyers. This new codification of laws became, as a whole, a net of secularly enforced controlling statutes that regulated every minute, every aspect of the lives of the people, just as the U.S. Code assures a federal corporate ascendancy over the exclusive personal rights of the people of this nation. Now, I'm smart enough to say, what's wrong with that picture? All of a sudden, the people with the power are the subjects to the federal organization. To solidify this seizure of the body of law, the legislature further recognized the judicial system. L the legislature caved in, and uh, the, even the office of the clerk of the court was, uh, that was once elected is now appointed. He goes on to say, and I, very important information, uh, much of this, he says, I believe, that they could abrogate their responsibility for the welfare of the people and pass it on to the feds. They were most happy, and these are our local officials along with the people, to line up at the trough along with their indolent subjects for federal handouts. In doing so, they were bound to servitude to a central government by the adhesion contracts that were attached to these grants and so-called endowments. Now, from a historical perspective, the story of a corporate federal federalism has been written in this nation, and the writing began in 1861. To you, like me, who are the non-historian types but find it absolutely fascinating, I just love what was stated today, with, one, uh, with the onset of the Civil War, there are those who contend that the Civil War was God's judgment as punishment for the pursuance of slavery. In point of fact, this hypothesis, according to the sheriff, is both fictitious and spurious. The war was fought to roll back or nullify the Tenth Amendment and to establish corporate federal control over states. 
Nowhere in the Constitution is Congress given authority to regulate local matters concerning health, safety, morality of the state uh, residents, the county residents, or the milk that you can drink. Blows my mind. These powers are reserved by the Tenth Amendment to individual states. Until the last quarter of the 20th century, this misdirection allocation of governmental power was viewed, viewed with grave concern. But it seems we have now come to a complete voluntary capitulation to federal corporate control and are on a short road to world government. But here today, in this special event, amongst you special people, in this very special place, I ask, is that so? No. It is not. And one of the bright beams of hope is our next guest speaker, Sheriff Richard Mack. Let's give him a big hand. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate being back here with you in uh, St. George. I uh, love Utah. It's been our second home. And my police career started uh, here in Utah back in 1977 in Provo. Uh, I actually was a, a part-time meter maid while I was working my way through college at BYU. And that's how I got introduced to law enforcement. I was actually trying to become an FBI agent. And uh, my father was a retired FBI agent. And uh, that never worked out. So I decided, uh, and while I was even deciding to get in the FBI and trying uh, to get in the FBI uh, in Provo, I uh, decided to hire on full time with Provo Police Department in 1979. Uh, and I thought that that would also uh, help uh, attract me to the FBI. And uh, it, it never worked out. So I stayed at Provo Police. And uh, I had a very traumatic experience there. I actually got assigned to work uh, a, about a year assignment as an undercover narcotics officer. And uh, I hated that with a passion. And uh, there was one other person that hated it worse, and that was my wife, uh, who's here with me. And uh, she had to become a, a single mother because we could not be seen in public. We could not go to church together. And we could not be seen anywhere in public together, wife, family, other, uh, nobody. And, uh, I'd have to sneak home late at night to be able to see my wife and kids. And it was a horrible uh, time for our family and marriage and, and my life. And uh, I had to live in the drug culture uh, in Utah County, and I hated that with a passion. I, I never participated in those things in my life. And now all of a sudden I had to like, uh, look like the biggest druggie in the world. But anyway, um, right after that assignment, uh, I was back on patrol for a little bit before I took some other uh, promotion assignments and uh, public relations and community outreach programs that they assigned me to. And uh, I was writing a lady a ticket, and an epiphany occurred to me. And I realized that what I was doing to this woman was wrong. And, oh, yeah, she ran the stop sign. Make no mistake about that. But I learned and I felt that she wasn't in the wrong. I was. And I decided that I had to change my attitude and start all over. And I've already been a cop for three and a half years. I already worked undercover, been everything in law enforcement. What was I looking for? And I was walking and wandering around, and I ended up in the city clerk's office, and I asked her something that, to this day, I don't even know why I asked her. And I said, uh, ma'am, uh, when I started my job here in 1979, did I take an oath of office? And she goes, well, sure you did. You signed it. And before I could ask, she handed me a copy of it. And it actually said, I, Richard I. Mack, swear or affirm that I will faithfully support, defend, and obey the United States Constitution and the Constitution of the state of Utah. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I decided that I was going to have to quit my job. And I'm going to go quit my job right then and there because I was a liar and a hypocrite. I took an oath so I could have a paycheck and a fun job. 
That's why I signed that document. Just hurry and get this oath ceremony thing out of the way. I want my job. I want my fast cars. And I want my fun, exciting TV type job. And uh, so I decided that uh, I was going to quit. And when I was walking from the city side over to the police side and the lobby, I imagined going home that day and telling the pretty little blonde girl that I married a few years before that that I had just quit my job. And this was all in my mind that I'm having this conversation with her, but I knew her well enough to know that I thought, you know, this is how it's going to go. And she's going to say, okay, Mac, let me see if I got this straight. You quit your job today because you're a liar and a hypocrite. We can't pay the car payment or house payment and get the kids new school clothes because you're a liar and a hypocrite. And I said, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And uh, she goes, could you have possibly considered quit being a liar and a hypocrite and keep your job? <laughs> and I go, thank the good Lord for a good wife. And do you see how smart you ladies are? You win the argument and you're not even there. <laughs> well, that's how she was. I, I think she was my new conscience. So I put my Sam Brown back on and, and put my badge back on and went down to briefing. And then I went home. And there's the pretty little blonde girl in person this time. And she goes, what are you doing home? And I said, I'm getting the World Book Encyclopedia. She goes, to go on shift? And I said, yeah, the one that says U.S. Constitution. And I decided that every time I wasn't on call, I would be reading that book. You see, no one had given me one of these at that time. I had to read this great big old gargantuan World Book Encyclopedia. But any time I wasn't on a call for the next week, I had that book in my patrol car, and I'm reading the Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights. And I was really impressed. I loved it. And then a few weeks later, after I'm into this study and, and this epiphany is still occurring to me, an announcement comes on the bulletin board, Constitutional Studies for Law Enforcement Officers. And of course, the instructor's name was Dr. W. Cleon Skousen. I decided that I was going to go to that seminar because I had heard of this man quite a bit. He uh, used to work in the FBI with my father. And uh, so I went to the seminar, and it was a two-day law enforcement training session. And we didn't talk anything about mainstream law enforcement. We talked about his book and his class, so titled, The Making of America. We learned about the Founding Fathers and the miracle that America was in the first place. And I don't know what happened to the other 239 cops that were in the room, but this cop was converted, and I mean heart and soul, to the U.S. Constitution. And when Dr. Skousen spoke, I felt the spirit of freedom so strong. And I learned while I was sitting there that the spirit of freedom was merely the spirit of God. And I was so impressed with the power of this message and the power of this man. And I took another oath while I was sitting there in, an audi in the audience. And I said to myself, no one else heard it. I will never be on the wrong side again. And I continued on with my career. And uh, things were going great in our lives and our career. And I was getting promoted. I was climbing the ladder pretty quick. And uh, you know what happens when things are going great in your life. <laughs> the in-laws call. And my wife's parents call and are lobbying me to move home to Arizona, where both my wife and I are from, and run for Graham County Sheriff. Now, I always thought it'd be pretty neat to be in law enforcement in my hometown, but this was absolutely absurd. I've got 11 years on with Provo. I can retire in nine years, then move home and run for sheriff. Oh, no, they wouldn't have anything to do with that. We had to move home now, because if we didn't, they were going to have a a corrupt sheriff get elected, and, and uh, I had to prevent all that. And so I'm telling them, no way, I'm not doing it. So finally, I have my wife just take the calls and tell your parents we're not doing this. This is the first time my wife ever agreed with me that her parents were crazy. And so she would tell them, leave Richie alone, we're not moving home, forget about it. And so finally, they had other people lobbying me from Arizona and trying to get me to move home. So I told my wife, I said, let's just list all the pros and cons why we can't do this. There was 23 cons why we couldn't do it. No way we could do it. And maybe two reasons pros were just to move home and be closer to family. Her parents and mine both lived there. 
And uh, so we sent that down to him, and it was about three weeks later. We moved home and ran for sheriff. <laughs> and uh, you have to realize this was really quite a miracle. Uh, we hadn't lived in Arizona for 12 years. I had never been a cop or in law enforcement in my hometown, ever. And I walk into town and say, make me your head law enforcement officer. Uh, really, I've got good professional experience from Utah. You, you'll have to trust me on that. And so um, I was elected in 1988, reelected in 1992. And then in 1993, I know this is really going to shock you, but somebody in Washington, D.C. started lying about the Brady Bill. His name was Bill Clinton. <laughs> but you have to know it was okay because it was for the children. Okay? <laughs> And uh, he actually said, as he propagandized the Brady Bill, that the Brady Bill was going to make our streets so safe in America that even our nation's police officers would not need to carry guns anymore. That's what he said. He's good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and I love that Washington, D.C. entertainment. But that's all it was. I certainly wasn't going to sue over that. But then on January 21st, 1994, we had a sheriff's association meeting in Phoenix. There's only 15 counties in Arizona and only 12 sheriffs at this meeting, but there's three strangers in the room. And I find out that they're all agents of the BATF. And they hand us a document, and they said, it took three of them to hand out 12 documents. And they, they said, sheriffs, these are your marching orders as to what you will do to comply with the Brady Bill background checks. You must conduct these checks within five business days. You must keep the records. You will decide who can and cannot have a gun in your community. And you will pay for the whole thing. There's no money attached. No grants this time. No money. No, no carrot on the stick treatment. Oh, and by the way, this is probably never going to happen. But we got to let you know. You'll read there in this document. There's a provision that if you fail to comply with this mandate from Congress, you're subject to a year in jail subject to arrest. Folks, this is all true. I'm going to show all this to you. I'm, I'm an investigator, and I want to show you the evidence. And you know, I'm really glad Steve uh, came along today, because I always felt a little bit comfortable. I always show this quote that he already showed you from Scalia in the decision. I said, I always wondered. Well, first of all, I've always corrected Scalia and said, the states didn't surrender many powers. They said, maybe two or three if they surrendered anything. But why would they surrender anything? And I always wondered about this. How do you divide sovereignty? How is it that you have two sovereigns, especially on the same issues? So now I get to really extend this presentation a little bit on that issue. It makes so much sense. The founders wouldn't have been that confusing on an issue so vital to our freedom. And so at this meeting of sheriffs, all the other sheriffs uh, hate the Brady Bill. Everybody hates it, and uh, not just me. But the meeting went on and on, and after about five or six more hours, the cussing waned, the emotions waned, and the president of the association said, okay, sheriff, each sheriff, tell me what you want to do on the Brady Bill. All of them acquiesced and said, there's nothing we can do. We'll just have to go along. And about five or six times, I heard the, the phrase, you can't fight City Hall. Who wants you to believe that? City Hall, especially the one in Washington, D.C., because they're all powerful. They're omnipotent. They have the Supremacy Clause, remember? Well, the Supremacy Clause doesn't give them anything and doesn't guarantee anything to them except that they have to follow the Constitution. And it's only supreme when they do. So the federal government has no supremacy because they don't do anything in accordance with the Constitution anymore. Haven't for a long time. So now you have to come up with a solution to that tyranny. And so I told the other sheriffs, I said, I can't go along with this. I just have to let you guys know there's no way I can go along with this. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm not going along with the Brady Bill. I'm not going to do it. You all said in this room, and you've convinced me entirely, that the federal government cannot tell us what to do as sheriffs. Let's make this very clear, my dear friends. The President of the United States has no authority, has no jurisdictional power, has no constitutional authorization. 
to tell your sheriff or anyone else in the state to do anything. The, the president isn't alone on that. The United States Congress, same thing. They have no authority to tell us to do anything in this state. And if they have no authority to do that, how did the EPA get it? Yeah. They have even less authority. So, well. So uh, I have a, a two and a half, three hour drive home and I'm brooding and brooding about this Brady Bill thing. What am I gonna do? And halfway home, I'm in Globe, Arizona and I make two decisions. I am not going to quit my job over this. I don't think my wife will let me anyway. <laughs> Two, I am not going to comply. So I've got a conflict there, don't I? I'm leaving myself open to federal scrutiny and maybe federal arrest. And then I'm brooding all the way th from Globe to Safford, which Thatcher, we lived in Thatcher at the time. And uh, about two blocks before I get home, it hits me and it scares me to death. I'm gonna sue my own government. A small town sheriff from Arizona. The county's 35,000 people. I've been sheriff maybe five years. And I'm gonna sue, I'm gonna do David against Goliath. David only wins in the Bible and even then very seldom. And so I'm really scared about this and, I'm not, and now I'm wondering how in the world am I gonna tell the pretty little blonde girl that I'm gonna sue the Clinton administration. She's gonna be so excited about this. <laughs> and I want her to come up here and tell you what happened next. She can tell you in her own words, where'd she go? There she is. All right, there she is. <laughs> Don, <laughs> did I just tip it? Okay, okay. He came home actually, and he just blurted out that he was gonna sue the government over the Brady Bill and would probably lose everything. He'd be squashed like a pumpkin seed. Is that what you said? <laughs> Something like that. A pumpkin. <laughs> I mean, and um, I actually kind of felt like I do right now. My heart's pounding, <laughs> and I, it, it scared me. And I just sat on the bed and said, well, um, maybe this is why you were elected sheriff, and that was such a miracle. Maybe this is what you were supposed to do. <laughs> and we, were, we really weren't looking for a job when you were elected sheriff. And I've never been able to stop you from doing what you believe in. And so I guess we're going to have to do it. <laughs> and um, he was right. We did. Um, he, the people in his constituents didn't understand exactly what he was doing. Maybe it was our fault because we didn't explain it well enough. But um, he, he did lose the, the election, and uh, we, we lost our home. And then we thought, what, what was that all about? You know, he stood up for what was right, and he, st he still lost. But then look at all the founding fathers we sacrificed. You know, we didn't really have much to complain compared to them. And, um, I, uh, and then few years down the road, he was had the opportunity to start spreading the message. Actually, when he, he won the, the uh, Supreme Court case a few months after the election, 10 months after the election. So if he would have won the Supreme Court case, I think he would have probably uh, won the election, but that wasn't the case. And he started getting a lot of notoriety because of what he had done. So he started traveling around the United States, spreading the message. And the, the, our children, we have five children, they did, didn't um, get to see him much. So we decided to come up with a plan that they could um, 
they could travel with them, take turns traveling with them and going to hear what their dad was actually doing and hear the message so that they could understand and spend time with their dad. And um, I often thought, like, what if I wouldn't have, have said okay? What, what if I wouldn't have stood behind him? Where would we be now? And um, we have met so many wonderful people all over the United States. We felt alone a lot, but when we have traveled and met really good people like all of you, um, we're not alone, and we can't do it alone either. So uh, um, <laughs> I am thankful for him, and we ha it has been a rough road a lot of the times. But um, we have to stand up for what we believe, no matter how hard it is, and stand with our spouse, no matter how hard it is, um, and just have faith. And um, that's, that's it. <laughs> Um, I can only tell you that if uh, she had said anything that a normal wife should have said, <laughs> this would have never happened. The decision was made after I entered the house and after I got her endorsement. Because when she said, well, we weren't really looking for a job when we landed this one. I kind of chuckled a little bit and I smiled and I said, I'm gonna take that as a yes. And I remember her response was just kind of in passing, just she shrugged and uh, looked at me and, and said what the few little things she said. Uh, the main thing is she said she didn't understand any of it, but that she understood me. And so then she went about getting the kids ready for bed and I went to work the next day wondering, okay, now what do I do? I'm gonna sue the federal government. Anybody wanna tell me what I do? Call a local lawyer on Main Street? <laughs> He's gonna tell me what my wife should have said. Are you nuts, Sheriff? You know, and uh, so uh, I was not a member of anything, nothing. No national organizations, no local clubs, nothing. I had no backing to turn to a group and say, how do I sue the federal government? But my undersheriff walks in, his name's Mike, and I said, hey, Mike, um, you're a member of the NRA. Uh, do they have a toll-free number you can call and get advice? <laughs> and he says, here's the number. I don't know what you're going to get. I call the number. I get passed around a whole bunch and put on hold a whole bunch and finally land in the office of Richard Gardner. He's a, he's a lawyer for the NRA. And I told him who I was and what I wanted to do. And he said, Sheriff, we've already been preparing the paperwork on this case and we've been praying that you would call. And I said, wonderful. And that got me all excited. I said, so we're going to prove once and for all the Second Amendment is a God-given right and it bestows a God-given right, protects a right to keep and bear arms. And he goes, Sheriff, calm down. We're not even suing on the Second Amendment. And I said, you're the NRA. That's what you do. He goes, we have no standing on the Second Amendment and neither do you. He says, but we, you have standing and we will take this case as far as it will go and pay for the whole thing on a 10th Amendment challenge. And I said, states' rights? And he goes, yeah. He says, the federal government has no authority to tell you to do anything. And I smiled and I said, even better. And I says, but I want my own lawyer on this. I said, I really appreciate your willingness to help and especially provide financial support to this whole thing because I have no money, but uh, I want my own lawyer on this. He says, that's fine. We'll work with your lawyer as much as you want us to. He says, that's great. And I said, can you recommend a lawyer out here in Arizona that knows the Second Amendment and the Constitution? And he goes, yes, Dave Hardy in Tucson. He used to work for us. I called Hardy, hired him as my own lawyer right then and there. And on February 28, 1994, in federal district court in Tucson, Arizona, my lawyer with the lawyers of the NRA filed Sheriff Mack versus U.S. And this was in the courtroom of one John M. Roll. You'll remember on January 8th, he was murdered in Tucson, Arizona. 
This was a good man. This was a principal judge. This was a man of courage and of honor and of integrity. And let me read in my first book, in fact, Judge Roll's handwriting is all over my writing. And on page 19 of my first book, in fact, that's my wife's little hand. And you know how women have to have a hand in everything? Well, she was definitely that way. And she, she's holding my dad's old snub-nosed FBI gun from my cold, dead fingers. And that's how I felt about the Brady Bill. And uh, Judge Roll, on his ruling, said this. And without him, this would have never made it to the Supreme Court. And his was the most powerful and broad decision in so many ways. Look, listen to what he said. The court finds that enacting the Brady Bill, gives the numbers, Congress exceeded its authority under Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, thereby impermissibly encroaching upon the powers retained by the states pursuant to the Tenth Amendment. He's the only judge also that heard the case of all the seven sheriffs that sued and all the circuit courts that heard this and the Supreme Court that heard it ultimately. He's the only one that gave us the Fifth Amendment as well as the Tenth because he was very concerned about the threat of arrest and it violated my rights to due process. And he so stated in this decision. So six other sheriffs after I filed joined the lawsuit. We all won at the, the, at the district court, the first level, we all won except Sheriff Coog from Texas. How do you lose a state's rights, gun rights case in Texas? I don't know, but he did. And then Sheriff Prince and I were consolidated. Prince was from Montana. We were consolidated because we're in the same circuit we went to San Francisco for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We lost. We got overturned. But Sheriff Coog and Sheriff Romero from Louisiana made a huge comeback, and they won really big at the Circuit Court in New Orleans, Fifth Circuit. And my lawyer said this pretty much guarantees us a trip to the Supreme Court. And on December 4, 1996, Sheriff Prince and I appeared at the U.S. Supreme Court. And on June 27, 1997, the United States Supreme Court ruled that indeed the Brady Bill violated the provisions of the Tenth Amendment and that the federal government could not tell us to do anything. And that you will see now the evidence of this case of how it restores, reinforces, and dusts off the Constitution, state sovereignty, and the Tenth Amendment. And let's ask ourselves right now, and I, when Steve was talking, I asked myself this again, and I'll ask it to you. Who's supposed to enforce the Tenth Amendment? Who's supposed to guarantee and stand and fight for state sovereignty? Are you waiting for Barack Obama to appoint the state sovereignty czar? No. It's us. We have to. It's state officials. It's the sovereign responsibility of the sheriff who promised you that he would defend your constitution. What does this say? What does the oath say again in Utah? Support, defend, and obey the United States Constitution. And thereby he becomes your protector. And uh, I think as we work together with our sheriffs, county commissioners, and local authorities, we can take back our country we can take back our constitutional republic county by county and state by state. Uh, if you haven't learned this yet, uh, there really isn't much going on in Washington, D.C. that provides even a semblance of hope that they will, that the tyrants will turn around and do a 180 and change their ways. That has never happened in world history, and it's not going to happen now. But we have good people here locally that we can depend on. They're our neighbors, and we can work with them and remind them of our duty and responsibility to freedom. There is nothing that your local officials can do that's more important than keeping their word to uphold and defend and obey the United States Constitution. There is nothing more important than that. Okay? Yeah. You had a job that you thought made a difference, that you thought was honorable, and then you see this. We're afraid if I take.
body any deeper. No one's going to like what I find. You took an oath. If you recall, when you first came to work for me, and I don't mean to the National Security Advisor of the United States, I mean to his boss, and I don't mean the president, he gave you word to his boss. Amazing, isn't it? I think this is maybe the only second time I've heard anyone pay any attention or talk about the oath of office and how vital it is and that you give your word and that your word is who you are. In all the first 10 years of my law enforcement career, I never heard of that talked about once. Never. Not anywhere. At any level of government that I see this being talked about. And now we have a movie from Hollywood of all places, <laughs> clear and present danger, talking about the oath of office and that you didn't swear it to me, your boss, and you didn't swear it to the president. You swore it to his boss, the people. And that's where it is. That's where the oath is here in Washington County, in St. George. It's where it applies. It's to you. And can you imagine any official not keeping his oath and not keeping his word and that they actually replace it with other agendas, political agendas? And that's where we are today, actually. We have replaced the Constitution with selfish political agendas of both mainstream major parties in this country. And we've got to stop it change it and go the other direction. The answer is not ahead of us. How many times, oh, we got to move forward. No, we don't. We got to turn around and look back and find the answer. It's in our history and it's in our foundation. And we cannot pretend any longer that we can destroy the foundation, our constitutional republic, the foundation of our republic, and think that the rest of the building is going to be just fine. Once the foundation goes, it all goes. We are the generation watching and witnessing the death of America. And it will be up to us to apply CPR because she's on life support. CPR, what's that? Constitutional principled resuscitation. Okay. <laughs> There's the oath, and this isn't exactly the oath in Utah. I like the one in Utah because the one in Utah says obey. But you'll notice every oath in this country, no matter if you're a domestic officer or military, the United States Constitution is always first. You know why? Because nothing supersedes the Constitution. There is no law in America that supersedes the Constitution. Why do we take an oath of office? Does anybody know? Is it just tradition? No. The Founding Fathers required it. They put it in the Constitution itself. Oh, good, thanks. Yeah, here, uh, this little, this is the oath that your sheriff swears to here. In fact, he's the one that relayed this to me. I do solemnly swear that I will support, obey, and defend both Constitution of the United States and the state of Utah. Let's hold them all accountable to that oath. Okay. Now. Here's the constitutional, here's the supreme law of the land, the founding fathers who devised the Constitution requiring that each of us in government take this oath. It says, who has to take it? The senators and representatives aforementioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial uh, officers. So we have all three branches of government. Which branch does your sheriff work for? The executive. Okay, we're the executors of the law. 
both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. All three branches have the same distinct responsibility, support and defend and obey the United States Constitution. Does any one branch work for the other? Then why does law enforcement always say, we don't make the laws, we just have to enforce them, and we have to do what all the judges say? No, you don't. As long as it's constitutional, you can keep working with them. But we have a responsibility to tell judges no if they violate the Constitution and ask me to do something unconstitutional. And then they say, well, who are you to decide what is constitutional and what isn't? Well, I'm the sworn constitutional officer. And I have to read the Constitution to be able to understand my duty. And if you haven't read it, no wonder you're violating it. But I have no responsibility whatsoever to go along with any legislator or any judge if they are violating the Constitution. Now, Steve brought up state nullification. Did Steve and I make that up? No. This is being talked about back in 1798. Thomas Jefferson writing the Kentucky Resolution back then when he was Vice President of the United States. And look at that sentence in yellow. He said, states have the authority to judge the constitutionality of the federal government's laws and decrees. You know why the states have that authority? Because they were independent and autonomous nations and they were sovereign. And that's why. Because they formed the federal government to do a few assignments. And they delegated a few assignments to the new federal government. And that's why they get to decide if the federal government's outside the Constitution. And he even went so far as to say, states should refuse to enforce laws and decrees, laws which they deemed unconstitutional. Yeah, you don't go to court. <laughs> Madison, in the Virginia Resolution, took it even to the next level and said that, look at the word he uses, interpose that the states and state officers are to interpose. They have a duty to interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing its people. Oh, that would never happen in America. Uh. <laughs> I guess we could probably answer that, that it has happened a few times in America with three words. I-R-S. Now, these are the two litigants in the case, just by way of history, Prince and Mac. And here's Judge Roll again. You can see what a absolutely insen uh, what a sensitive and ingenious man he was. Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the act, subjecting himself to possible sanctions. Look at this. The other time I've heard somebody talk about the oath of office, he was absolutely correct. My own government was forcing me to choose between keeping my oath or obeying their stupid law. And any time any public official that you have here working for you is forced into that same quandary, which one do you want them to decide with? Do you want them to obey the Constitution or obey stupid laws? There's the threat of arrest. That's in the little pamphlet that uh, Steve showed you. These are back on the table. Um, there is a, a nominal fee for them, but please take these home with you. you. Anybody that you've ever argued with about the lack of authority the federal government has, just hand them that and let them read it. Then tell them if they have any questions to call Steve. Okay? <laughs> okay. Look at this. Under a separate provision of the gun control act, any person who knowingly violates, was I going to knowingly violate? I think so. My wife already gave me permission. The, the uh, section of the Gun Control Act amended by the Brady Bill shall be fined under this title, imprisoned for no more than one year, or both. So we actually, at this time, we were looking at this. My, my lawyer says, do you want to get an injunction against the federal government for being able to arrest you while we're in court? And I, sure, I said, sure, yeah. I'm sure my wife and kids would 
like to sleep better at night knowing I'm not getting hauled off by the, the jackbooted thugs of Washington, D.C. And they, so we actually filed for this. And the other side, of course, gets to respond to try to quash the order of protection or the injunction. Janet Reno wrote a memo to Judge Roll and said that the federal government, the United States Congress, didn't mean this uh, threat towards the sheriffs or the CLEOs, the chief law enforcement officer, as the Brady Bill calls us. And uh, so the judge said, well, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Reno. Uh, I'm granting the injunction to Sheriff Mack because you're not allowed to interpret the laws for Congress, and you can't change the law by fiat. That's and I got the injunction. Yeah. So. Are you going to get out of your seat and get to the back? You see, my dear friends, this is the greatest example in American history of what we do with stupid laws. You see, this happened not in Nazi Germany, but in Montgomery, Alabama, on December 1st, 1955, to an American citizen. And if it can happen to her, we don't make exceptions. We don't have this, well, you're sovereign, but this is less sovereign, or we're equal, but you're less equal. And this was endorsed by our Supreme Court. What did they come up with? Separate but equal in America. Yeah. You see, and they haven't stopped doing this. They just go to different groups. You gun owners, you're going to get to the back of the bus. You homeschoolers, you're getting to the back of the bus. Or you farmers who want to deal in raw milk, you're getting to the back of the bus. And you people who want to be just left alone by government, are you kidding? Get to the back of the bus. Because government will not leave you alone. We will say what you are and what you are not. And you see, this is such a huge impact on us today. Because we have to ask all our local officials, ask your sheriff, ask your favorite cop, ask your favorite detective, if you were called back to Montgomery, Alabama, December 1st, 1955, to make this arrest, you see the bus driver gets off and gets on the payphone and calls the sheriff's office and two deputies come out and they arrest her. She is handcuffed. She is booked into jail. They, they fingerprint her. They photograph her because she didn't give her seat to a white man. That's why. It wasn't just her tradition. It was the law. Now, ask your favorite peace officer, would you arrest Rosa Parks that day? Would you uphold the law, enforce it? Remember the law that you always spout off with? We don't get to pick and choose. We don't make the laws. We just enforce them. You see, a constitutional sheriff would have got on that bus that day, would have sat down next to her, would have shaken her hand, and would have told her, Mrs. Parks, what you did here today was the most courageous thing I've ever seen. And my deputy and I are going to make sure you get home safely. And we're going to offer you extra patrol on your home for the next few days. And you make sure you call us if you need us. But we'll be there as often as we can, regardless. 
That's a constitutional sheriff. You see, he, didn't, he made sure she didn't go to jail. He made sure that her life, liberty, and property were protected. And what did he do with the statute? He put it where it belonged, in the trash. Okay? Now, we should have never heard of Rosa Parks because somebody in uniform should have made sure this never happened. Somebody with a badge, somebody who knew and understood their oath of office should have made sure she got home safely, not go to a jail cell. And the same thing for Rosa Parks today. The person who wants their constitution and their rights and their life, liberty, and property and the pursuit of happiness protected by the very people who what? Swore an oath in God's name to do just that. We've got a lot of work to do, don't we? Okay. We're going to skip over a few things. Look at this. Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, said, talking about the IRS, our federal tax system is, in short, utterly impossible, utterly unjust, and completely counterproductive. It reeks with injustice and is fundamentally un-American. Who's supposed to protect you from injustice? There you go. Look, now we're into the case. This is Judge Antonin Scalia. And look at the power that this case has provided us all. We have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. Don't you wish your state legislature knew that? <laughs> Would you make sure? You cannot just give them this. Make sure all your county commissioners, your city councils, your school boards, do they do anything without saying, we have federal mandates we have to do? The federal government did not elect you, school board. The people of Washington County did. Make sure they read this. Don't just give it to them. Take 10 minutes and read it with them. Then you'll know they know, okay? And then leave it with them and tell them to study it. They ought to read it probably seven or eight times. And then that last three times, like Steve was talking about. Make sure they get it. These two should always accompany each other. These are the two most powerful booklets you can have in your pocket. Okay? Okay, here we go into Steve's part that he brought up on this. And I'm really glad he clarified this and went through a great historical lesson here. It is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. It establishes some rules for the federal government, but it does not give them our state sovereignty. Although the states, and I have always said this in my presentation, I said it yesterday even, although the states surrendered many right there, you know that's wrong right on its face. He actually corrects it on the next page, uh, although it might have been accidentally. Although the state surrendered some of their powers, and we need to cross off that word, he's wrong on surrendered. We didn't surrender anything. We delegated. We gave them a few assignments in Article 1, Section 8 of the enumerated powers. They have about 17 assignments. And a bang-up job they've done on those, huh? Okay? And if they don't do it right, can we take them back? Of course. We delegate. We give it back. Take it back, okay? Some of their powers to the new federal government, this part is true no matter what. The states retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. If the state of Utah was inviolably sovereign, don't you think they'd be able to control, I don't know, maybe their own land? <laughs> you own more than we do. You guys are about 71%. Arizona's 85% controlled and owned by the federal government. Just ask them, they'll tell you. My county of Graham, 95%. And nobody's doing a thing about it, okay? It's time we take back our land. You're not, okay, Arizona, we're not sovereign if we can't own our own land. We control our own lakes and streams and education and finances and health care. None of that. It's all taken over by the feds. We're not, we're not Arizona. Let's be honest. We're not Arizona. We are federal enclave number 48. 
And Utah would be federal enclave 47? Was it 46? Okay. So uh, until you own at least, I'd say, over half your own land, then sorry, you're just an enclave. And uh, so let's not say Utah and Arizona anymore, shall we? Let's just call it like it is. I got a better idea. Let's take back our states. Okay. Now, Scalia says a few more things, and we definitely, there are some definite things in here you want to see. Residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course, in the Constitution's conferral upon Congress, here he corrects it a little bit, of not all governmental powers, but only discrete enumerated ones. He's talking about how the Constitution was guaranteeing the impotency of the federal government. So which implication was rendered expressed by the Tenth Amendment? And so he quotes the Tenth Amendment because ours was a Tenth Amendment challenge. All the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states. All powers are ours or the people. And remember, we didn't surrender any of them. The great innovation of this design was that our citizens would have two political capacities. Yeah, that's okay. We have a federal government and we have a state government. But get this, each protected from incursion by the other. That part is true. If the federal government comes into Washington County or the state of Utah or into St. George and commits an incursion, an entry or a trespass, where they are outside the Constitution, who then, according to this, and according to common law and common sense, who is supposed to protect you from those incursions? The state and state officials and political subdivisions. Should we allow the counties and cities to have some of the fun? Well, sure, and guess what? He actually quotes James Madison in the Federalist Papers where Madison says, yes, the local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. And yet Obama is suing Arizona on the supremacy clause right now because it says we're supreme. We get to tell you what to do. Does anyone think that the founding fathers were devising a constitution after putting up with the war and stopping the incursions and the tyranny of King George III that they said, yeah, but we're going to devise a constitution that creates another tyranny here in America? No. No. We were, the whole purpose of the Constitution was to limit what the federal government could do. And so for anyone to say, yes, the Founding Fathers created a supreme central government, and we're here to tell you what to do and control every facet of your lives and every facet of your states. We are in charge. We are supreme. Madison says even the counties and cities share the supremacy. He should have said with the states <laughs> right then. And he even goes in to say that no more subject within their respective spheres than we are subject to them in their respective spheres. Let's see what he says about this sphere. I like this sphere thing. The separation of the two spheres is one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. What is Scalia saying? State sovereignty is a structural protection of liberty. Just as the separation and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of, of, of excessive power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. Do we have a healthy balance of power today? We'd have nothing of the sort, and the states have got to exercise their sovereignty and take this back. Because when you came to this meeting today, did you want to know how to reduce tyranny? Yes. There it is. It's called state sovereignty. And Scalia even knew that that is a, what? Structural protections of our liberty. The states have got to get busy. And because of that, he quotes Madison again. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other. 
at the same time that each will be controlled by itself. Any question, anybody in this room at all, please raise your hand. Any question as to whether or not the federal government will control itself? <laughs> Good. That's the answer I wanted. Laugh. The power of the federal government, this again is in the little book. All these quotes I just said were all are right here. Only a 16-page little book. I don't know how we fit so much in there, Steve. Man. Okay. The power of the federal government would be augmented immeasurably if it were able to impress into its own service and at no cost to itself the police officers of the 50 states. In other words, they cannot do that, can they? But can police officers of the 50 states go along and join up voluntarily? Yeah, because they're offering money. Okay? We have got to cut the financial extortion ties with the federal government. Okay? And that means we stop sending them our money. It does. Okay? Scalia clarifies the supremacy clause in here, and I don't think there's going to be any argument about this one. He does it exactly correct. Okay. The federal government, here's Scalia again in the decision, the Mac Prince case, we held may not compel the states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program. Just where do you think Obamacare is going to be enforced? Where do you think it's going to be administered? From Washington, D.C.? Let me make this very clear. I might have to move to St. George so Sheriff Pulsifer can protect me, but I'm going to tell you this plain and simply in front of my grandchildren, in front of my daughter, in front of my wife. I will never, under any circumstance, participate, use, borrow, or take advantage of nationalized, socialistic, communistic health care, ever. So. Now, Okay. Now, Scalia wants to call the other side stupid. There's four judges that dissented in this case. Okay? I want to show you this. This is actually in the booklet. Scalia is actually saying this. He wants to call him stupid, but he knows his mom would really get mad at him if he used that word. So he puts it in the legalese, and it's there in yellow. Empty, formalistic reasoning of the highest order. Now, I'm going to show you why he wanted to call him stupid. This is the dissenting opinion from Justice Stevens, who just retired a year and a half ago. If Congress believes that such a statute will benefit the people of the nation and serve the interest of cooperative federalism better than an enlarged federal bureaucracy, because we know how they hate that, we, he's talking about the Supreme Court, we should respect both its policy judgment and its appraisal of its own constitutional power. Now, do you know why Scalia wanted to call him stupid? Because that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. The federal government, or the, the uh, United States Supreme Court telling the Congress they can do whatever they want. And do they? Wow. There's my favorite quote from the entire decision. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. If we have every state official complying with that, you'll get your freedom back tomorrow. In fact, I'll even go far enough to say 30% of your local officials, if they abide by that, you're going to get your freedom back tomorrow. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution to the crisis of the day. The crisis of the day. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Just the, mon just the mantra of the Obama administration. Okay, last one. The government derives its power from the consent of the people. Every government. Everywhere. Well, let me make this very plain to you, sir. We do not consent. And we will never consent. And what you've got to do is you've got to go back over there to your parliament and you've got to make it very plain to them. 
You've got to tell them that what we're fighting for here is, a, is a freedom from what we consider to be the rule of a foreign power. I mean, that's all we want. That's what this war is all about. Jim. No, 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 no. Now, now we, we established this country in the first place with very strong state governments just for that very reason. I mean, uh, let me put it to you this way. My home is in Virginia. The government of my home is home. Virginia would not allow itself to be ruled by, by some uh, king over there in London, and it's not about to let itself be ruled by some president in Washington. Virginia, by God, sir, is going to be run by Virginians. <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, this is the movie Gettysburg, and that's General James Kimber, and he was killed in that battle. But before he left, I don't know if this was true, but it's certainly true. This is the best example I've ever heard of state sovereignty. Utah, my good friends, should be run by Utahns. Washington County should be run by local Utahns, right here. We are not subject to federal direction. Again, if you take that to heart, if you know and understand the principles of state sovereignty in our Constitution, and if we are not subject to federal direction, then how is it that the EPA and IRS are our boss somehow? It was never meant to be. And we have got to have local officials with the courage to help us turn this around. And we've got to stand with them. And we've got to stand behind them. And we've got to help in every way. This is our country. This is our republic. This is our freedom at stake. We are watching our country die. Now, when I was at that police training, at one point, Dr. Skousen and I were becoming pretty good friends, and we were up until the time he died, and we stayed in touch. At one time, though, he handed all 240 cops at that meeting his book. He handed it to me, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, promise me that you'll teach these things to your children. And I kept that promise. And now I teach them all over the country. And I've started teaching them to my grandchildren. And uh, the oldest one isn't even five years old yet. But she's here in the audience today, and her name's Libby, because she was born on the 4th of July. <laughs> See, her name's really Liberty, Liberty LaDawn Hardy. And I want to share with you what I've taught to Libby and to my children and what Dr. Skousen taught to all of us cops at that meeting that day. He had all 240 of us get up, big, tough cops, and he taught us a little kindergarten exercise. And I call it America's political prayer. And maybe it's not a prayer at all, but maybe, again, it's the only one we got left. And I want to dedicate it to each of you and to your children and grandchildren because it's to my grandchildren and to my children as well. I want to dedicate it to Dr. Skousen and to Judge Roll. God rest their souls. And I want to dedicate it to the founding fathers that made all this possible. I want to thank you for being here so very much. From my heart to yours, this is what Dr. Skousen taught me. At police training, it goes like this. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America, and that's the eagle. Long may she be free. Thank you so much. Can you feel it? Is it a paradigm shift? 
We're going to feel out of our comfort zone when we're not guilty until proven innocent. How will that be? Um, we're now going to go into a break, a 15-minute break, and there's water.